Today I'll demonstrate how to make oh, an perfect. inexpensive homemade hollowing system for a small to medium sized wood turning, you know, something this size or smaller. Yeah. In addition to hollowing a form like this, I'd like to be able to hollow pretty much any form that I can create. So regardless of the lip or any profile feature, I want the hollowing system to be able to handle that. Okay. I also want the system to include a simple, reliable, accurate wall thickness indicator. During the hollowing one of these, I'll actually spend more time checking the wall thickness as I work my way down than I do hollowing material because I'm, I'm nervous about cutting these walls too thin or actually cutting through. So that wall thickness indicator will give me the confidence to cut quickly and efficiently and produce these types of wood turnings without a whole lot of stress. So given those ideas, I'll show you what I've come up with. I'll assemble the hollowing system now and show you each component. We start with the front tool rest. Okay. The next component is a two by six outrigger. This two by six is 21 and a half inches long. All of the wood components on this build are made out of scrap, so none of the dimensions are critical. Okay. Now, this two by six was pretty badly cut, so I ran it through a surface sander to flatten out the top and bottom a little bit, but they're still both cupped. I'm going to bolt this to the lathe. The outrigger does two things for me. It lengthens the lathe, and it also gives me a much wider angle of attack for my cutting tool. Okay. So it's a very valuable component. Okay. The next component is the back tool rest. Now then, again, this is made out of scrap that I had left over from a previous project. What I basically need is something to support the back of the tool. So this only has to stop a downward force. So this has a T-shaped cross section. If I made another one, I would make an L-shape. I'd bring the plywood down to the base and then I'd bring another piece over just big enough so that I could clamp the back tool rest to the outrigger. Okay. May be tempted to screw this down, but I tend to move it back and forth depending on what I'm doing. Sometimes I move the outrigger, sometimes I move the back tool rest. Okay, the next thing is the cutting tool is going to slide along this surface. So I sand the wood and get it smooth. Then I coated this with polyacrylic, which is just a fast drying hard surface. And I sand that smooth and then I wax over the top of that so that I just get a nice slick surface to work on. In order to keep the tool from the cutting tool from sliding off the edge, just drilled holes that accommodate these nails. And this is really just the bare minimum of what I need to do. I need to stop that downward force when I apply force on that tool. Okay. And I'll show you in a little bit how to adjust or how to cut this to the correct height. The next component is the cutting tool itself, and it starts off with a quarter inch diameter high speed steel cutting tip. Okay. That fits inside a quarter inch diameter hole and is held in place with a quarter 20 set screw. The next piece is a half inch diameter steel rod, and this rod is 14 inches long. I've got a one inch deep quarter inch hole drilled at this end, and then I drilled and tapped for a quarter 20 set screw above that. So after drilling this end, I used a, a wood block to pound this steel bar into the tuba six. 
and then I drilled a hole through the two by six to steel bar and then back out the bottom and drove a nail in there to hold this in place. I left the nail proud in case I want to take it out. And on the bottom, I ground away the nail so that it's sub flush it's below the surface there. Okay. The two by six is also 14 inches long, but that's because it was scrap and I, it's 14 inches long because I trimmed the edges to get rid of the really ugly part. But it's again scrap and this is as long as you want it or as short as you want it. You do need to keep it long enough so that you can move it and you also want it long enough so that you can resist the torque that a catch would have. Okay. Now, how do you set the height to this back for this? First thing you do, move the front tool rest up close to a blank, spin the blank and mark the center and then adjust the height of this front tool rest until the cutting tool, the tip of the cutting tool is right on center. Okay. Then I take a block and a couple of wedges so that I can adjust the height. Now start by just eyeballing and that looks too high. Stop it down, something like that. And that may be good enough. But to get a little bit better, I'll take a digital level, lay it on the bed, zero that out. Adjust this okay. Then I'll measure this and I get three and fifteen sixteenths. I'm going to call that four inches. If this is raised up a little bit, it'll tip that tool downward a little bit, and that's acceptable. I just I don't want it tipped upward. That's likely to cause a catch. I want it flat, or I want it horizontal, or tipped down slightly. So, and now I know to cut this at about four inches, and I'm ready to go. I'm not going to get carried away making anything exact. Because if you watch somebody turn, if you watch how accurately do they hold that back of the tool level, it's not very accurate at all. So there's no point getting excited about getting super accurate with that. Clamp this back in place. And get this back. So this is the basis for the hollowing system. I can hold the tool down, hold the back of the tool down, and start start hollowing. If I need to come in at a strange angle, I just slide the outrigger over, and I can come in with a different attack angle. I can also loosen this and move everything back and hollow deeper, okay, until the bar starts vibrating. That'll be the minimum or the maximum depth that I can go. Okay. Now if it turns out that I can't hollow the top of the profile the way I want to with a straight cutter, then I'll have to make another tool so that the cutter comes out at an angle. Okay. Now it's kind of interesting that with a straight cutter, there's going to be very little torque that wants to rotate this tool in this direction, in this about this dimension. It may want to rotate this way with the catch, but it simply doesn't want to rotate that way very much. So a two before would be plenty. Also, if you have a gooseneck tool where you bend your rod out 
and bring it back and then you adjust it so that the cutting tip is in line with the center of this rod then build again be very little torque trying to rotate around this dimension so you can get away with the two before also provided that tip is in line with the center of this rod about the only time you need the width of a 2 by 6 is if you have a substantial overhang with an angled tool. But given the straight cutter, an angled tool, and a gooseneck, and the ability to present this tool at just about any angle you ever need to, this thing should be able to cut any profile or hollow any profile that you're interested in. Let me get this put back in here. And by the way, that is a homemade set screw. I want to replace that one day with a quarter 20 Allen cap, but I'll have to wait till I go shopping. So. Okay. In order to build this, the two hardest components to make are the steel rod, because they have to drill the end of it. And it's kind of difficult to drill that, although it's easy when you know how to do it on the lathe. And the same applies to this. So later on, I will actually drill both of these components and make another tool okay but this is the basis for the hollowing system for a straight tool an angled tool and a gooseneck you can make just about any profile you need to now it's time to assemble the wall thickness indicator and again i'm going to use scrap to build this i have a piece of roughly one by one cut from a two before at one end, I drill a half inch diameter hole. Six inches above that, I drill a seven eighths inch diameter hole. Cut a slot in both ends so that the wood can compress a little bit. Sheet rock screws will actually initiate the compression. This slides over the rod, steel rod, and it's clamped down with the screw. Then I have a 7 8 dowel, and I'm using this dowel because it was scrap and it was handy. And to that, I attach a plywood carriage, and this holds my cell phone. I can't use my cell phone in this demonstration because I'm using it to, to videotape it. But my phone fits snugly inside here, and there's a hole for the camera. This dowel slides in this hole. And I aligned that hole above the cutting tip, tighten it in place, this piece of cardboard represents my, my cell phone. Uh, I have the camera for the cell phone here and that lines up with the hole. And that hole lines up with the cutting tip. This rectangle represents the screen on the camera. Okay. Once I've, I have an image, I can see the cutting tip and I can see the half inch diameter rod. So I take a piece of tape and put it over the screen of my, my cell phone and I draw that cutting tip. And if I want a quarter inch wall thickness, I measure out from that tip a quarter inch in several different places and then just connect those dots with a dashed line. Okay. Oh. When the tool is buried inside the wood turning, I can't see the actual cutting tip, but I'll still be able to see this image that I drew. And I'll also still be able to see this image that I drew that says you're within a quarter inch of the wall. Okay. So the idea is that this will sit inside here and I'll be able to watch and the, the outside wall of the wood turning will move as I cut and it will move until it comes up to this line and then I know to stop. And as I rotate my tool, and then I'll stop at this other point so that any point of this line touches the outside of the wood turning, I know to stop. And that's true for any angle of the tool. No matter what the angle of attack is on this tool, I know that I have to stop then. Okay. 
very reliable. Now there is one problem with this. If I look at the image of that cutting tip on this screen, it's not a quarter inch. Now I know this thing is a quarter inch wide. So what I have to do is set the magnification. So I'll take a ruler and set it at the tip of the cutting tool. I'll take another ruler and set it on top of the screen so that it's close to that, so that I see the image of the lower ruler near the upper ruler. And I adjust the magnification until one inch is the same on both of these. That way I know that I'm getting one-to-one -one imaging between the two. And that cutter should be a quarter inch wide. Okay. And that means I really will have a quarter inch wall thickness. So that's one problem I have to be aware of. I have to change the magnification. I also have to be aware of the fact that if I don't do anything with this screen and I just run it in the video mode or the photograph mode, after a certain amount of time, it will go into power saving mode and it will change that magnification back to the default, back to the default level. I have to be aware of that. On a good day, I remember to touch the screen every now and then. It just becomes habit. On a bad day, I'm constantly seeing that screen go black and I have to pull it out and reset everything and then start over again. Basically, reset the magnification, but I, I habitually check the position every time I pull that, that cutter out. So this is a really cool system, but it has two problems. Because all of this is wood, it can vibrate. And it's, it's not enough to bother me too much, but every now and then it, it, it starts vibrating. And I need to stiffen this up a little bit. I can do that by moving this riser forward or convert some of the wood to metal. The other problem I have with this is the power saving mode. And I don't know how to set my phone so that that doesn't occur. But even with those two problems, I'm very, very happy with this system. It saved me a lot of time and a lot of worry because I know where that tip is now. And I know what my wall thickness is. And it's a really cool system. Okay, that's the complete unit. We have an outrigger, a back tool rest, a cutting tool, a riser, a carriage for the cell phone, and then the cell phone that tells me where the tool is and what the wall thickness is. Okay, the next thing to do is to actually build this portion. Okay, and that'll be the next thing I do. Just about every tool I've ever bought or made, the handle and the shaft have been, have been aligned. And my body is accustomed to that. And I would I'd actually be hard pressed to learn how to use a tool if this shaft came out at an angle, especially if I have it very deep into a wood turning. So when I make the cutting tool for the hollowing system, I want to make sure this hole runs down the center line of this two by six or whatever my handle material is made out of. Now, in order to do that, I'm going to do the drilling on the lathe. So I take, um, I used on my tuba six is building this thing. So now I'm going to show you how to do this on a tuba four, which is perfectly good. Uh, I mark and punch the center of both sides. I put a half inch Forstner bit in a Jacobs chuck and I mark with a piece of masking tape where the two inch depth is. I've got that held in the headstock. Slide that point over the divot. I have a live center on my tailstock. I've advanced the quill until I just put a slight pressure on this two before. Rotate the headstock. Okay. Here's the game plan. I'm going to hold this two before so it can't rotate. And I'm going to turn on the lathe and I'm going to advance the quill and that's going to drive this two before in there. And that's going to give me a hole aligned with the center. Okay. I'm going to, before I do that, for safety's sake, I'm going to spin the lathe by hand and make sure everything's working. Make sure I'm strong enough to hold this. 
This is what it looks like. As long as chips are falling out, I'm going to keep drilling. As long as the chips were falling out, I just kept drilling. Once I saw that the chips had stopped, I started backing it out, and I made the mistake of not pulling the two before out with me. I do want, I don't know if you can see it in the camera, I stopped before the two before came all the way off the drill bit. Because once that happens, I don't have any way to control this. Okay. So let's try that again. Finish the cut. Finish the hole. Slide my tail stock forward a little bit. Make sure everything spins. Do it again. Just want to keep that hole fairly clean so I don't line up that bit. have to remember to push this way or pull this way with this hand when I back the quill up. I don't ever pull that board completely off of that bit. there and I'm almost at a quilt. I'm going to have to pound that to get it all the way in, but there you have it. I need to drill a hole that's a quarter inch diameter and about one inch deep into this steel rod to hold the high speed steel cutting tip. Now, you could put this in a vise on a drill press and drill it, and if you have that capability, that'd be the best way to go. You could also put it in a lathe, and if you could run this bar all the way back, then you could drill it from there. I can't fit this bar through my headstock, so I made a collet. Let's see how that runs. Ooh, got a bunch of them. Bring my center drill up, loosen that collet, see if that helps. Steel bubbles. Let's see if I can correct it by hand, pull that over. I still have a little bit of wobble. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to just put that center drill in the divot. I'll just go ahead and drill it. Now, I don't want to drill too deep in this because I'm going to convert this to an angle tool. But normally what I would do is use the center drill, mark that center, replace the center drill with a quarter inch bit, and drill that in a half or one inch, and then I would be done with that. Okay, 
every now and then I never get this wobbled out. It, it doesn't matter what I do. I can't get it close enough to drill it accurately. So I go back to the system that I used with the two before. I'll center punch both sides. I'll put a live center in the tailstock. I'll take the Jacobs truck in the center bit, and put it in the headstock, and I'll use the center drill to just put a divot in here, big enough that I can uh, get my live center in there and get this drill bit in there, or get the center drill. And then I'll drill center drill deep enough that I get a pretty good start, and I'll replace the drill bit, and I go ahead and drill, and that works. And it works even if this is bent just a little bit. Okay, because I'm lining up on both ends and I'm holding it in the center. And it's surprising that if you go slow enough, you can hold this with your hand and drill that. If you're uncomfortable with that, you can clamp it in vice grips and drive the vice grips either on the bed of the lathe or along the, the tool rest. And the idea is to just advance the quill slowly Make sure your chips are clearing and do it just like I did with the two before. So that takes care of that. And then you either glue your tip in or you need to go drill and tap for a set screw. And that pretty much concludes all the details on how to build this system. This is the deep hollowing tool that got me started on doing this kind of stuff. And it's 40 inches long and it'll reach 14 and a half inches into a wood turning. And this thing is longer than my lathe and it works really well for large and some medium sized wood turnings, but it's just, it, it's awkward to use on small and some of the medium wood turning. And that got me started about making the system that I've been showing you. And I was curious about whether or not I could make something that had interchangeable parts, like the big unit does. And uh, I was given a bucket full of scrap iron, and it turns out there were three of these three quarter inch bars in there. So I took a hacksaw and I cut the ugly off of each end, mounted it, in, mounted this in a lathe, turned it, used a file and sandpaper to clean it up, and this is what it ended up with. Then I used the same techniques that I showed you with the half inch diameter rod to get a dimple on this end to hold in the tail stock. And then I used successively larger drill bits to end up with a half inch diameter hole in here. Started with a quarter inch and then keep stepping it up a little bit until I got to half inch. That's about an inch and three quarters deep. Then I used the same half inch stock that I used in, in the, on the previous tool to fit in here. And from that stock, I made a straight cutter, an angled cutter, and a gooseneck cutter. And I'm thinking something of this size will be a good size for small to medium. Drill a three quarter inch hole in it and cut a slot all the way across to act as a hinge. The bar sits in there and then tighten these two screws and that holds it in place. And there's the cutting tool. And I'm curious to see how this compares to the half inch bar that we had. I'm hoping that a tool like this with these three types of cutters, and I may have to have two or three angled cutters and two or three goosenecks, but I'm hoping that with, armed with these three types of tools, I'll be able to hollow any form that I can turn or any form that I'll want to turn. So that's the goal. Let's see how that works out. 
And I'm hoping with these three cutters that I can make just about any form that I want. And I have a quick test to see if that's true. Let me clear the decks here. Let me mount my bowl blank. And let's see if these three tools in a three quarter inch shaft can hollow the inside. So this black line represents the inside of a hollow form. So I'll start with the straight cutter and just see how see where I can get. So start cutting along here. And it can no longer cut after this point, so let's mark that. Okay. Now certainly I can start at the bottom and work my way around until I get to about right here. So let's mark that. So the straight cutter can handle this region. These two regions. Okay. Replace the straight cutter with the angle. Let's just start here and see how far I can go. So I'll start there, work my way up. And it looks like I can safely get to about right here. Somewhere back in here, the angle cutter will. And now I can work it here. And in this region, I'm starting to cut at this very edge. Now I can certainly sharpen the cutter there and then just move this along. But that's problematic because. By sharpening this edge, I'm taking a wide cut, and that tends to be real grabby. I tend to have a lot of catches. Okay, so this angle cutter is not very good around this shoulder. Now let's use a gooseneck. I made this gooseneck for a much bigger bowl that I was making, a much bigger vessel, and let's see if it does us any good. Come to here. And now I've got a problem. I can't quite get around that corner. I'm cutting on the edge and I can do that. But it's not very efficient. So now I can get the tool inside the way I like it and cut it to tip. And I can join up here. So given these three tools, I can make I can make this form. I can hollow this form, but I don't do a very good job in here. I have a few options. I can lengthen this bit and see if that helps. And it, I don't think it will. No matter how long this is, this bit is, I'm still going to be cutting on its edge. So the other option is to bring this out at 90 degrees. And if I try to imagine that, that looks like it'll work. Provided I have a bit long enough. Another option is to shorten the length of this gooseneck and change this to a 90 degree. And if I do that, I have a 90 degree coming back in here, then I can make a big cut all the way around. But that 90 degrees is going to stop here and I'm not going to do a very good job out this way. So with the tools that I have, I'm going to have a difficult time following this form. But the interesting thing that I've learned in, in looking at this, if I make a drawing, an accurate drawing of the, of the form that I want to make, it will tell me what tool I need to get around this corner to get this transition zone 
until I can get to my straight cutter to hollow the bottom. I can make cardboard duplicate or cardboard models of what I need to make. And that'll tell me how to make pretty much any form that I want. So although this wasn't a success with the tools that I have, I now know how to modify my tools or use a piece of cardboard to tell me how to bend my gooseneck or what angle do I need. And after I have three or four of these made, chances are I'll have all that I need to make any form that I want. So that's where I've been heading with this. So I'll, everything is to get me to this point. It's time to test this thing. I have the lathe set at 1200 RPM. I have a piece of bone dry mesquite end grain and that'll be the test blank to see how well this thing cuts. And I have a 3 inch high speed steel cutting tip. Comes from stock like this and I'll score it and then snap it and get pieces like this. This stock won't fit inside a quarter inch hole, so I have to round the edges a little bit to get it to fit. But once I do that, it'll fit inside a quarter inch hole. And I've taken an oak dowel, half inch dowel, and drilled a quarter inch hole in it just like this. And I use this to sharpen these bits because this is the grinder wheel. I can start swing all the way around, end up over here. This keeps my fingers away from the wheel and I have good control. And it allows me to get a good sweeping arc all the way around. And I can sharpen all the way to the sides. Which makes it handy when I take these sweeping cuts. Okay. Another cutter I often use is a quarter inch round. And again, I'll score that and snap it. And put that in and grind it. And I grind a couple of different profiles. This one is a little bit pointed. I also cut a profile that's much more rounded. And on the rounded one, I sharpen way back onto this edge so that I can cut not only with the tip, but with the side of that cutter also. This one tends to remove more wood. It also tends to grab and catch more often. So the 3 16 square is my preferred cutter for a lot of this stuff. Now I've been told that those carbide inserts that people buy are really good. I've never used them, but I've heard a lot of good things about them. So you could cut a flat on here and drill and tap and just attach a carbide cutter there. And that might work better than high speed steel. I don't know. This is what I'm familiar with. The 3 16 is what I'm happiest with. So that's what I'll go with. Let's start to test. First thing I need to do is set the tool height to center. So. Mark the center. Bring my tool up here. I'm a little bit low. <laughs> that looks good. So, with the tool rest within a couple of inches, let's just see how this thing cuts. It's a pretty good cut. Those heavy cuts, it leaves a little bit of tear out. It's not a very good surface. So let's see what I can do to clean that out.
looks a lot better. I can see the grain. And with a little bit more work, this is going to leave a really nice surface. Okay. Not surprising, at an inch and a half, we do a pretty good job. Let's take it to five inches. About five inches. Let's try it again. Chatters just a little bit when I take a heavy cut and I get on get out here toward the outside, but it, the control felt good. I was happy with how I could can, how I could control the tool. Let's take it uh, take it to seven inches. See if I can get a region in here with real good surface cut. Actually, the surface finish is pretty good everywhere. I can feel the tool vibrate just a little bit, but it's not enough for me to lose control. I can even swing it around in this, this corner area without any trouble. See what happens out here where I have hard and then soft and then wood and then air. Just try to take a little bit off of there. cuts but it left a little bit of tear out in the softwood but it didn't vibrate out of control at seven inches I'm pretty happy with the way this thing handles now I need to be careful because I can see the tool and I know I'm much better manipulating a tool when I can see the tip so this is at seven inches in a hollow form I probably wouldn't do this well. I'd probably have more catches just because I can't see and I can't manipulate the tool that well. Let's go back to eight inches. Make sure I'm on center. raise the tool a little bit. If I had that back tool rest at the perfect height, I probably wouldn't have to change these as often as I do. But I'll worry about that later. Right now I want to worry about whether or not I can cut. So here we are at 8 inches. Not too high.
can see the tool vibrating. Let's take a heavy cut. Now, I can't control the tool at eight inches. Let's see if I can take light cuts and clean that up. cuts it helped out a lot but a heavy cut is just not going to happen at eight inches so for this half inch bar under good conditions I can deal with seven inches uh, five inches is pretty is real easy to control and I can probably do that consistently on a hollow form so somewhere between five and seven inches is my limit for this tool I could push it to eight inches but I would run the risk of a serious catch, or I would always have a bad surface finish, which may be acceptable under certain circumstances, but five to seven inches is what I'm going to call the maximum depth for this tool. I'm actually quite pleased with it because that's a reasonable size for a small to medium wood turning. Okay. Let's try this other tool. So, this is that three quarter inch tool that I've been working on. And I've got a straight cutter exactly like the other one. Uh, the tuba six that I built the other day had a crack in it and I couldn't tighten it enough to keep this bar from turning. So I went out and found the best two before I could find. And there it is. You know, I've started calling this the COVID-19 contraption because all the good wood I've used went into other projects and the only wood I have left over is junk <laughs> and it reminds me of the COVID lockdown. Oh, with a two for four and a three sixteenths inch cutter and a three quarter inch shaft, let's see what we can do at eight inches. It is eight inches, right? Eight. close to center. Heavy cut with good control. Try it again. See if I can just clean up an area, get a good finish. So here where I took a heavy cut, there's a lot of tear out, but in this region where I took a few light cuts, it looks really good. And I'm glad that I could come around this corner without a whole lot of trouble. So, I can only go another inch with this tool, so I don't see any point changing anything. This three-quarter inch bar makes a huge difference. If you're going to build one of these and you have, you have the tools and material, or you have a friend that has the tools and the material, I would go with the three-quarter inch bar if you could. But there's a price to be paid for that because now you have to have a bigger opening to get in. So the three quarter inch bar is far more forgiving and it lets you go deeper with better control. 
the deeper you go, the longer your handle needs to be. The half inch bar is quick and easy to build and it'll go five to seven inches depending on what you're doing. And that's in the mesquite end grain, which is some pretty rough stuff to deal with. So either tool is going to get you down five to seven inches. The three quarter inch bar would take you quite a bit deeper with better control. We're set up now to test the wall thickness indicator. So I have the riser and the cradle for the cell phone camera. A uh, couple of things are different. Uh, the riser I built the other day cracked. So I finally had to get rid of it and replace it with a maple one. This really is a COVID-19 contraption. Uh, and I've also added a rubber band above the camera so that if I do get a catch, the camera can't pop out. And now I have a lamp over here to illuminate this side of this cedar blank. I've turned the first half inch or so down to a quarter inch just practicing. And uh, now I'm ready to put the camera here and demonstrate how this thing works. So here we go. Okay, I have the camera in the cradle. Put the rubber band over it for a little safety. Get the cutting tip. I'm going to put the. I've already set the necessary magnification, and I'll show you how I do that. I set one ruler on the cutting tip, I place another one on top of the screen, and then I adjust the magnification until those two rulers are the same size. And this tells me I need a magnification of 1.7. And I write that down so I remember it. Okay. And I've already put a piece of clear tape over the screen and I've already drawn the cutting tip and then added the line that indicates a quarter inch wall thickness. So I'm seeing something like this on the screen. Okay. Now, when I'm cutting, I can't see the tip, but I can see the image of the tip. And as I bring this, as I cut, there'll come a point where that dashed line that I have on top of the screen meets the outside edge of the wood turning. And that tells me I have a quarter inch thick wall. So let's fire this guy up and cut about an inch worth of material and see what happens. shavings and now I'll make one more pass and set my wall thickness. See how we did. Here are my calipers set about a quarter inch. Everything slides along quite well. I've got a little bump. Yeah, I can feel a bump in one spot, but I could easily clean that up.
check that again. Okay, that's how that works. I'm, I'm really impressed with how well this system works, and it doesn't matter if you have a straight wall or any kind of curve. I've had really good luck with this, and uh, it's been definitely worth it. The only problem, the, the biggest thing I wish I could change is this is my cell phone inside there. I wish I had a throwaway phone that I could put in there, and that's something I want to look into. But uh, this system has done a really good job for me. I really enjoy it. In order to test the overall system, I turned a, a, a small vase and I left a great big uh, rim out here and then undercut and then just put a, a small foot on it and I haven't decided exactly what I want to do with this foot. And the idea is to create a region that normally gives me a lot of trouble. And let's see if this system can deal with this transition here. Okay. So now I'll move the camera along. You can see the cutting tip. Now as I move above the cell phone camera, you can see the steel rod. Here's the cutting tip, and you can see it outlined in black. And I measure out a quarter inch in various places, and that's where the dash marks are. And I create a curve that's telling me when I'm a quarter inch from that cutting tip, and that sets my wall thickness. Now I'm gonna move the cutting tip, and the camera follows with the tip. I'll move it inside the wood turning, now the turning is not spinning now, but each time I stop to forward motion, it's because I hit wood. Okay. We back that up just a little. As you can see, this is the wall thickness from the tip of the, from the cutting tip to the edge of the wall. That's the thickness of the wood. And all I have to do is start cutting until this black line touches the outside edge of the wood. I'll start here, and I can just move it along, and then I can come around this corner. Now I've drilled an inch and a quarter diameter hole down through the center of this, and I'm looking for that hole, and there it is. And now we're gonna go down deep. And there's the bottom of the hole. And here's where that foot breaks off. So this, this region here is the bottom of the part that I want to hollow. And I can see where my tip is relative to that. So I can see the outside of the wood and like x-ray vision, I can see where the tip is. So let's withdraw the tip. Now I'm going to find and then drag the tool along the inside of that rim. Okay, and that's how the wall thickness indicator works, and it works incredibly well. There is one problem with this system, though, at least for my phone. If I don't touch that screen every now and then, then it'll eventually turn itself off and go black like that. And when it does that, it doesn't just blacken the screen, it changes the magnification back to the default level. But other than that, the system works really well. Here's the final product. It's just an interesting shape to see if I could come back around this corner. Turns out a straight cutter and the gooseneck with all of that I needed. This is spalted mesquite, and I'm hoping a lot of this color pops out. I only had one problem. I had a, a dig in, and I don't even remember it happening. But uh, the tool worked great. Uh, this is, for mesquite, this is incredibly soft, and 
I was finished cutting before I really got into it. So I'm looking forward to doing some much bigger things with this and much more interesting shapes. Just as kind of a precautionary note, when I was preparing the blank for this, it, this was supposed to be much larger and had the bark on it. Uh, I turned the tenon and moved to the other side and started turning it and reached up to clean the face mask and I realized that I had it on but propped up. Uh, I lowered the face mask and went to turning and the bark came off in three pieces. One piece went away from me and the other two came at me. I'm glad I had that face shield on when this came apart. Just a cautionary note. Enjoy what we do. I love what we do, but we do have to be careful at it. Y'all have a good day. I need to acknowledge some folks. I didn't dream this up all by myself. I guess the first time I came across a deep hollowing system was one by Lyle Jamison. Uh, the outrigger, I saw at a demonstration by Al Hockenberry, and that really makes this thing a lot more versatile. And Jim Anderson published a tip in the August of 2019 American Woodturner, and he told about using a cell phone camera. And that, that vastly improves the system. A, a camera system makes a huge difference with this thing. You know, this was made out of scrap during the coronavirus shutdown, lockdown, whatever it is. And uh, it turned out to work much, much better than I thought it would. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. It needs some work. It needs some improvements. But overall, I'm reasonably pleased with what I was able to make with it. And I can make things much larger than this much, much easier than I've ever made these kind of things before.